Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I just want to give a little warning with a caveat at the end. Uh, this sermon today will be PG-13. We're going to discuss things that uh, we're dealing with the topic of sex. Uh, but I will tell you that it will be done in good taste. And if your child is 12 years and above, I think they can handle it. If, they, if you don't feel comfortable with that, that's fine. We do have... Um, Ricardo's going to take the kids to Starbucks, right? No, I'm just playing with you. Okay. <laughs> but uh, we do have some opportunity. We have great child care if you feel uncomfortable. But I, I just wanted to, someone said to me, and said, Pastor, why do you have to be so frank about sex? And first of all, I'm not frank. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is the Bible is very clear about sexuality. And the Bible is very, quote, unquote, frank about sex. Why? Before Frank was invented, or the terminology Frank was invented, the Bible doesn't mention any words. It, it goes right out and talks about stuff we don't like to talk about. In fact, I would, I would, I would tell you, and I believe, part of the reason we are in the trouble we are in as a culture and as a church is because we don't talk about these issues. I'm of a strong conviction the first person you hear about something from, you remember the most. The first time I heard about sex was not from my parents. It was from this guy named Richard in the neighborhood. He taught me to spit, to drink, and taught me wrong things about sex. Wonderful friend. I wish my parents would have barred me from him. It's terrible, the things I used to do and learn. And, and as a result, I heard the wrong information. And because I heard the wrong information, I drove the wrong way in some place. I had the wrong concept of it. And it's very, very important, parents and guardians, that your kids hear it from you. It's important. They, just last night, I'm going to go ahead. And last night, I was putting the kids to bed and talking to Luke and Hannah about this. I said, what are you talking about tomorrow? You want sex, Dad? You know, yeah, I am tomorrow. I said, can I come in? So let me explain to you what's going on. I get, began to explain to them once again. I said, you know, it's something that God made for married couples, and that's what it's for, a husband and a wife. And I talked to them about that and talked about that if we don't do it God's way, then there's trouble, there's, there's suffering, and all the diseases in the world. I started going on about that. So I just want to let you guys know I want what's best for you, and that's why I'm telling you, no matter what your friends say or what culture says, it's the right way. God made it that way. Well, why wouldn't he want to do it that way? That's stupid, Dad. I'm like, yeah, praise God. I love that. Okay. So, um, so that's what I wanted to mention to you today. But I, before we even get further about that, I also uh, wanted to mention to you that I understand that this, this particular topic is a very painful topic for many people. And I would venture to say today, everyone in this room is broken sexually in one way or another. Let me explain what I mean by that. I think a lot of us have had the wrong concept of it, had some poor, poor experiences in the back that still haunt you. And, and sometimes parents, we are afraid to talk to our kids about it because we didn't exactly do it right when we were their age. And so we don't want to tell our kids we screwed up, so let's just kind of avoid it. You know what I found the best thing to do to your kids? Say, yeah, I messed up. I did it wrong. Well, Dad, you're okay, and you did this, and you'll know. You don't understand. I had some consequences to pay from what I did, and this is why uh, I'm telling you to do it. I had a friend growing up, and, uh, and his name was Sean, and no last name for, on purpose because Facebook has drawn the world together too much. So, and I remember his parents used to be uh, it's just big smokers, and we'd be sitting in their station wagon, Ford LTD station wagon, with windows shut, going to see Star Wars, whatever we were doing, and they're, they're smoking up a storm, and they're nice people, but we were sitting there breathing secondhand smoke in the car, and I heard, heard her dad say, you know, Sean, I don't want you smoking cigarettes. It's bad for you. I'm like, <coughs> he says, and he goes, don't do what I do, do what I say. You know, and, and, you know, sometimes you hear that kind of thing. And, and so how do we deal with this issue? And I, I wanted to say that, first of all, I want to say something else very, very important. Very, very important. Uh, one of the biggest weapons the enemy uses against us, and we do have an enemy. He is Satan. He's not the pitchfork guy with a red tail. It is a real fallen angel that has legions of demons around the world, and their objective is to get us to believe a lie so that we can fall into difficulty. That's part of it, and to destroy the truth. But one of the things he likes to do is the devil likes to wear a clerical collar and likes to get the Bible and likes to be a screaming evangelist on television and whack people until they're bleeding and dead. My friend, that's what the spirit of religion does. Spirit of religion will kill and destroy. Spirit of Christ is always with the restoration process in mind. Right now is the time for that. So let me just please, if you memorize Scripture, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles right now. This is just a little beginning. Uh, Rome, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. 
Uh, you need to memorize this. If you memorize scripture, you need to memorize Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Why? Because it's a left hook to the enemy's jaw, okay? And if you don't like to memorize scripture, you need to memorize the scripture, <laughs> okay? And what's the scripture? There is, therefore. When it says that there is, therefore, it means as a result of. Because of all these things I've been talking about, as a result of. But there is, therefore, no condemnation for those in Christ. Now, this is not the Greek, but I like the way it sounds. I look at condemnation as condemnation. Condemnation makes you feel damned. And when you're damned, there's no hope. There's no sense. What's the use? I can't do it. I'm condemned. I'm, I'm a damnation. And so, I, I, and the Bible says, in Christ, there is no condemnation. And so if you have had a difficult past, if you have had been uh, promiscuous or you've had abortions or whatever you've done or whatever you've been involved with, the Bible says if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. That means you don't have to feel guilty if you're in Christ. There's no condemnation to those who are, listen to this, in Christ. It doesn't say they know Christ. It doesn't say they know about Christ. It means they're in Christ, like they're in the vehicle of God. If they're in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is. For the law of the Spirit of, li of the life, excuse me, for the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ made me free from the law of sin and death. The Bible is a wonderful thing that God has given us. It talks about the truth, but you can use the Bible to kill people or heal people. It's all based upon how you use it. If it's based in love, it heals. If it's based upon uh, self-righteousness, it kills. Religion kills. I, I'm not a big fan of religion. Or isn't this religious? No, religion is a system of man trying to reach God. While God, Jesus reached us through Jesus Christ. And religion is about all these things you have to do. Christ did it already for us. You can't save yourself. You just got to abide in what he's given you. There's a big difference between the two. And, and what happens is, when you make a mistake or you sin, you said this last week. I know I said it last week, but it's so important. I've got to say it again because this is an area that is a lot of brokenness in our society. Man, some of you might feel really um, guilty and condemned when I begin to talk about what I'm ready to talk about because of your past or what you're involved with. But understand, if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ and walk according to the Spirit and not the flesh. So there's hope for all of us, no matter what has happened before. And, and I, I will tell you that the enemy's job is to discourage. You know what happens to me? I, I, we're home. I'm a homeowner right now. I, I'm not the best homeowner. Ask my wife. I'm not really good at uh, taking care of the home. In fact, uh, I'm Bob Vila's worst nightmare. Uh, you know, when I put a hammer in my hand, I'm not a handyman. I'm a havoc man. I'm, I'm bad with a hammer. I, I'm terrible with a hammer. I try to put Hannah's blinds or her drapes up. And I put a big hole in the wall. Sandra had to come to my rescue. This is how you do it. You find the stud. Well, I'm the stud. No, you find the stud. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. I do it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and the day later it falls apart. I'm terrible. I, I, I just, I am not good at being, a, I tried, I, I, I went to the library, got the Time Life books. I look at YouTube. No matter what I do with the hammer, I, I'm, I'm a havoc man, not a handyman. I have, I, I just, I just not good at it. I'm terrible at it. I'm horrible at it and I've gotten so frustrated I'm like what's the use I can't do this so many of us feel that way about Christianity so many of us feel that way about God I can't do this thing you guys are asking me not to smoke not to drink not to dance not to have sex not to do this not to have fun you ask me to be baptized in lemon juice I, I just can't do that and so you know what I can't do it and because I'm a human being none of us like to fail so rather than fail let's just forget about it and so, like me as a homeowner with a hammer, I just want to give up. And so if you want to come to our house and help us, I would love you. Okay, that's beside the point. All right. <clears throat> Save my marriage. Thank you. Okay. But so many of us morally feel like that. We can't do it. My friends, none of us can really do it. That's the good news. The good news is Christ can do it. And so, yes, you're going to screw up. Yes, there are mess-ups. But thank God for Jesus Christ who sets us free from the power of sin and death. I absolutely love how it talks about that you are that. And another thing about Christ is this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. All the guys can catch up with me. We have a new program we're trying to 
2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. I love this. Therefore, here we go again, therefore. If anyone, that means man, woman, child, rich, poor, smart, not so smart, whatever. (laughs) If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things, including your screw-ups, have become new. So be encouraged this morning that if you've messed up, it's an opportunity for a new day. If you feel condemned, like you can't do it, that's not of God, that's of the enemy. If you feel, man, I really messed up, i got to get my act together, I know I can do it, that's different. God is like a good coach on a team. And the Holy Spirit's like a coach, you know, a coach in the middle. It's like, you guys, we're losing. We're losing 18 nothing. Come on, you can do this. You can do this. He might even yell at you. Why? Because he wants you to perform better than you are because the coach believes in you. And often God gives correction because he believes in us what we can do through Christ Jesus. So I want to make that really clear this morning because what we're talking about, I understand, is painful for many of us. And everyone in this room, I would venture to say, has some sexual brokenness in one way or another in varying degrees. Why? Because we're broken people. None of us are perfect. And if you think you're perfect, you're the most prophetic human being on the planet. I hate to tell you that. You're like, okay, I'm just starting. I'm just telling you that. I mean, if you don't think you can be a fool, you're the greatest fool of all. All of us fall compared to God. None of us are perfect. None of us have the ability to stand there and say, oh, all of us have sinned. Is that clear? I hope we understand that this morning. You don't have the right to look at other people. And so this series is going to take us into some uh, charted waters that are controversial about homosexuality, what the Bible has to say about it. So about today is title, by the way, um, which I hope we get through it. I couldn't do it last service because I really want to unload this first part. It's a uh, great sex and marriage and preparing for sex while a single. What is that all about? You've got to wait and see. Okay, let's go open your Bibles, please. Let's review a little bit last week. When you go against God... You don't break the standard. The standard breaks you. When you go against God, you don't break the standard. The standard breaks you. God has created us. God has made us. He knows what's best for us. He's the great designer. He has systems. He's got patterns of living that actually work. And when you go against him, there's consequences. Not because he's angry with us. He said, this is the way to go. And if you walk this way, you're going to be healthy. If you don't walk this way, you're going to avoid the warranty. You're going to hurt yourself. You can't go back to the... I just talked to someone the other day that that their iPhone broke, and they went to a a third party to get it fixed, and the person um, tried to do it as a result of that. Another person, a third party, trying to make it right, they avoided the warranty. They could have had a new phone. My friends, the same thing happens to us. When we try to fix it without God, it voids the warranty of working. The Bible says... Let's go ahead and look at this. 1 Corinthians 6.16. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Last week we spoke about why sexual sins are worse than others. Not because God's approved and have, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. No, because he designed it. He knows what happens. And the Bible also says, in the next verse over, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee sexual immorality. It doesn't say stay away. It doesn't say, uh, no, it says flee. Run away like Joseph. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does or woman as outside the body. But he who commits sexuality, sexual immorality sins against his whole body. I want to illustrate this this morning, what that means. Now, I tried very hard, so don't, don't give me a hard time, okay? This is the Hispanic man. An aging, kind of like, I just want to put a bald guy in there to make you feel better. They say that bald people have more testosterone. So I'm more manly than most of you guys with hair, okay? Hi. Hello. Okay. And and so let's just call this guy um, John and Jane, okay? And this is John and Jane. And this represents their lives. The Bible says right here, as we read the Scriptures, it says every, it says, it says, the two shall become one flesh. And he who sins sexually sins against his own body. When you have sex, the Bible says the two shall become one. The same Greek word used for that has the same connotation of glue. And so when you are intimate with someone and having sex with somebody, it isn't your spouse or wherever, what you're doing is you're joining together like this, and you become one. 
It's something that takes place. It's not just a physical thing. It's an emotional thing, and it's a spiritual thing. Every other sin of the body is outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against himself. Why? Because God wants us to have a close relationship. The Bible says that uh, he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Why? Because the Bible says, let's continue to read what it has to say here. It says, flee. Verse 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own, but you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God your body. It also says in verse 16, the two shall become one flesh, right? Verse 17 says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. It compares marriage and sexual union to God. Now, I know that sounds bizarre. But the closest human relationships we know of is a, between a husband and a wife. And God says, this is a little signpost of what I have for you in heaven. He's not talking about sexual uh, exploits. What he's saying is the closeness and the intimacy and the joy you have from this relationship pales in comparison to what you can have with God. And so he talks about that. So what happens when you have sex with somebody? Well, let me show you what happens. You become one. And I, for the sake of time, I didn't have time to let the glue dry. And so now what happens when you break up with somebody? It's a real appropriate word, by the way, break up. Let's just see what happens when you break up. I'm going to try to get this. Oh, my goodness. I did it too good, huh? No, I don't need it. No. That's not funny. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Here we go. Wow. I should be the strong man here. Really. It worked in the first service. Oh, my goodness. This too doesn't want to break up. <laughs> Forget it. I got to do this, though. This is driving me crazy. I, I don't want to fail. Kevin, you're so strong. Where's Big Steve when you need him? He's not here? Okay, help me out here. Ready? We'll break that apart. Will you please? Let's break this couple up. Come on, strong guy. You think you're so tough. <laughs> it worked really good in the first sermon. There you go. Come on. Live it up. Come on. Give it up. Stand up. You laugh. But that's what happens in the spirit. It's not funny. Stop laughing. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, seriously, all kidding aside, there's shards of the other person with the other person. The Bible says, Hugh, I'm out of breath. <laughs> he who sins sexually sins against their own body. And so you, you have part of the guy's face is in here, and part of the woman is here. You see her lipstick. Okay. And so you have both parts, if each other is a part of that. When you break up, this is what happens. Does it mean you're damned for the rest of your life? Does it mean you have the red badge of courage on you as you read in grade, grammar school, which they don't do anymore because of a common core? But okay, that's a side point. <laughs> what happens when you break up like this? This is what happens. You be two with one flesh. And when you break apart, there's part of each other. And my friends, it's not a pretty picture. It looks a lot better. Let's see this, doesn't it? And so I tell my kids, and I'll tell you, stay away from this stuff until you're ready to commit to a relationship called marriage. Why do you want to go through this and walk around like this? Well, God forgives. Yeah, God does forgive, but there's collateral damage that there's, you still have to face and still deal with. There's situations that you have to deal with. Why go through this? This is why. We're not trying to stop your fun, and neither is God. He wants, he's made you. He's designed you. He knows what's best for you. And so if you went through a couple of marriages, there's grace. The Bible says you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, and God will forgive you. No doubt in my mind. The Bible says it. But how many people know there's still stuff you've got to deal with? God forgives you, but there's still damage. You, st you get your car crashed. You get it fixed. How many folks, your insurance rate goes up? you still got to deal with the reality of the situation. And my friend, sin costs you something. God forgives you. But on this side of heaven, this earth is not so fair. So you may have messed up. 
there's been people that we've known. Uh, there's a girl at Teen Challenge that was my dad's church a number of years ago that used to be a prostitute. You would never in a million years think that she ever was. She was, she was like pure as a driven snow. She was beautiful. She had an innocence about her. God can do an amazing work. But my friends, this is why don't have sex before you're married. It's not worth it, guys. It's the pain it creates. And so I want to encourage you. The reason the Bible says these things... I'm getting a crowbar next service. The reason why the Bible says these things is because it cares, God cares about you. He's designed you. Building a fire is awesome. If I, if I had this logs of fire right here, uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to light on the fire. Said, Don't do you crazy? No. It works good in the fireplace, but it, without a fireplace, it brings damage. And sex outside of marriage, my friend, brings damage to all of us. And so I want to talk today a little bit first about great sex being married. And so let's continue to read the scriptures this, uh, this morning. Let's go ahead and um, verse 20. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The reason why God wants you to glorify him in your body, yourself in his body, because he doesn't want to see you hurt and broken. Do you understand that? It's not like God's like, I don't want you having fun. No, he designed it. He made sex. He made it fun, right? But in the proper context. I also want to say something here, and I'm jumping ahead of my notes because I think I need to say this. If you're single, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. In fact, you can prepare for great sex as you're single. Amen. So how does that work? <laughs> how does that work? Well, give me, give me a moment here. We're reading something from the Apostle Paul. Did you know the Apostle Paul, who wrote this particular um, passage of Scripture in the third of the New Testament, was a single man? He was a single man. Why isn't the Catholic Church, you can't be married to be a priest? And then the other Protestant churches, you've got to be married or you're weird. Well, I think there's some place in the middle there. What do you think? There's advantages to being single, and there's advantages to being married. Embrace wherever you're found. That's for next week. But right now, I want to focus on this. Don't be ashamed of being single. There's somebody else you might have heard of that was single. Lived for 33 years and impacted the world like no one else ever has or ever will. And in his person, his name, the dead are raised, blind are made well, most powerful name of all. Guess who that person is? Jesus was single. Okay? Come on. Don't feel bad because you're single. And this is the problem, I will tell you. You can be alone and in bed, married, more than you are by yourself at night. Because you know what the problem is? You're trying to find the one instead of know the one. The only one that can truly satisfy you is God. Your spouse will never measure up to God. If you make your spouse God, they're going to disappoint you. If you realize they're falling like they're you and we're going to go together towards God, you're in a much better place. Well, with that being said, let's continue to read. For you were bought with a price, verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which, got, which is God's. Verse, chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things by which you wrote to me. Apparently they had some concerns and questions. The Apostle Paul spent the last six chapters telling them what they really needed to hear. Now he's answering some of their questions. And, and please understand, he's, an, he's answering their questions, so it's kind of hard. It seems a little out of context, so you'll see it in a few, few moments. He says, now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. He's basically talking about if you're not married, it's a context here, okay? Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Okay? Let the husband... Render to his wife the affection due her. The word due is like duty, okay? Do her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife, get ready, guys. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Can I hear an amen, amen? You guys are afraid what your wife's going to say. <laughs> if this was a men's meeting, you're like, yeah! Let me see that hairy chest. Oh, come on. Oh, uh, I'm going to say something. You guys are afraid. Come on. Let me read that again. 
Let the husband render his wife the affection. Oh, I made a mistake. Nevertheless, because of sexual immoral, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Thank you. There's an honest man here this morning. And likewise, uh uh-oh, here we go. The husband does not have authority over his own body. Come on, women, let me hear you say hello. They have a lot more courage than the men. I think we found a little problem in this church we need to work on. Okay. And the wife does. Let me read it in context because you guys are interrupting me. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but instead the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, this is unbelievable that the Apostle Paul wrote this in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit at this culture. This is scandalous. This is kicking religion in the face. Because in that culture, women were property. I don't know if you realize this. You, you want to know what it was like back in those days? Uh, go hang out with ISIS in Afghanistan or Iraq. Go to Saudi Arabia and hang out in some of the extremist mosques. And you can see, and I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it because it's true. Islam does not honor women. I'm sorry. That's not politically correct, but it's the truth. Women have to cover their heads. They're second-class citizens. They're not as good as a man. Do you realize that Judaism was the most liberating thing in the ancient world? that Judaism treated women better than any other culture around them? Do you realize that Jesus was the greatest, glorious Stalin has nothing on Jesus? He was the greatest woman's liberator that ever was. You see, we get confused. This is a whole other issue. We get confused with value over function, and that's a whole other issue. But women and men are equal in God's eyes. They're equal. They have the same value. One is not greater than the other. They have different roles, of course, in different ways, but their value is the same. And so this is one of the ways that the enemy gets us, is through this not treating. And in this culture, for the Apostle Paul to say, hey, uh, guys, your wife owns you. You're not your, whoa, Apostle Paul, you liberal guy, you, Gloria Steinem. She doesn't even exist yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, but, you know, this situation, you have to understand how scandalous this was. This is amazing for the Apostle Paul to say this was unbelievable. We, we just read it and just, oh, whatever. That's a big deal. And so when the Bible says, what is that supposed to mean? Well, let's continue to read because the Apostle Paul does a great job here. Verse 5. Uh, come on, guys, get ready here. Do not deprive one another except for cornerstones, 21 days of fasting and prayer. No, I won't do that. <laughs> Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may not give that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And what, does this, what does he mean here by this? He's saying, listen, it's wrong, and he's speaking authority here of scripture, it's wrong for a husband to deprive his wife of sexual intimacy and also it's wrong for a wife to deprive her husband of sexual intimacy you're supposed to be together we're going to talk about this more next week but the act of marriage is a covenant and every time you have um, sexual relations with your spouse you are reaffirming that sexual con- that sexual contract that the covenant if you will the Bible says, do not deprive each other except for a period of time of fasting and prayer. And so that's why no one likes to fast and no one likes to pray. I understand that. But there's a time. He says, come back. Lest Satan comes and tempts you. There are some people that please, no one in this room, no one in this, but I've known people that have not had sexual contact with their spouse in over 10 years, 10 months, 10 minutes. Can you believe that? It's, it's not good to do that. That is, that is a part, that is marital abuse. Is it grounds for divorce? No, it's not, it may not be grounds for divorce, but it's grounds to get some help. Some of the people in this room are, uh, are sexual anorexic. And, and, and the reason for that, you need to get some help. We're actually going to partner with um, uh, Safe Harbor Counseling. They're going to have a room in our church to help people with various issues because we all have things we need to work on. We believe you need to get help. 
in this area of, of sexual intimacy. It's important that you have sexual intimacy if you're married. Uh, it really is. It's part of the marriage. And, and this is this truth of the matter is this. Husbands, the only valid sexual expression in your life is through your wife. Not flirting at the girl at the gas station, not flirting with the girl at work, not viewing pornography on your smartphone, or your smartphone becomes a stupid phone when you do that. Pornography is not the proper way. Flirting is not the proper way. Instagramming is not the proper way. The only proper way is through your wife is the only valid expression. Wives, the only valid expression of your sexual fulfillment is not through a book written by somebody that sold 100 million copies. It's not reading about Fabio, who's now Flabio. It's not about that. The only valid expression of your sexuality is through your husband. And if you go other ways, you get sick. You know, it's so interesting to me. I, I, I'm not really good about this. If I don't eat, I eat anything. And so if, if you're hungry, the vending machine Twinkies look pretty good to you. But if you're eating satisfying at home, the junk food doesn't do much for you. Why create more temptation for your husband? Why create more temptation for your wife? It's just not a good idea. And it's unbiblical. You're sinning by not by depriving each other of these things. So your homework assignment today is read the Bible. <laughs> and do what it says. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4 and 5, Marriage is honorable among all, the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with the things you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now, there's a couple things in here I want to mention to you in that scripture verse. Marriage is honorable above all, the bed undefiled. What that means is simply this. The bedroom is a sacred place. It's not dirty. Last week we spoke about the Platonic people that believe in Plato, that sex is bad, it shouldn't do it. Then you had the pagans, do whatever you want, it makes no difference. Well, the truth is God has made sexual intimacy in marriage. It's a beautiful thing that you should participate and cultivate in your marriage. Now, what happens if you have no sex at all in your marriage? What happens then? Sometimes there's medical reasons. Sometimes there's sickness in the house. I understand that, okay? But what does the Bible have to say? This is what I believe the Bible has to say. And I, I quote this all the time. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. There's two ways in a marriage that work. Give and give. You know, if, <laughs> if you're a taker, you'll never be satisfied. If you're a giver, you will be. The Bible does not say, for God so loved the world that he took. It doesn't say that, does it? For God so loved the world that he... Okay. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. If you want good sex, you have to think about your spouse and not you. The problem is this. We've been trained, especially men, we've been trained through the brokenness of pornography and culture that you have to get some. And so the woman is nothing but a satisfaction playground for you to get what you want. I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to conquer. I'm going to kill the bear. I mean, it's like going hunting. I'm going to go and kill some and bring some home. That's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of I'm going to get what I want. And the more you grab, the more unsatisfied you are. Why? Because you're created to give, not to take. Now listen to this. You're created to receive not to take. What's the difference? A <laughs> big difference. Receiving is taking something with appreciation. Grabbing something is a selfish, it says right here in Hebrews, we just read it, we just read it right here. Covetousness. So, what's one of the ways in, that will make a good sex life in marriage? And by the way, this is important. You need to start giving to your spouse. It doesn't mean just in the bedroom, it means all through the day. I love once in a while when Sandra and I, we should be more of a while, but my parents are retired now, so we have more. When we send the kids away, we just spend time eyeballing each other across the table. It's not eyeballing each other, but you know what I'm saying. 
you know, just something that happens. We, we spend time together. We look at each other. And, and the thing that brought us together keeps us together. Just a little bit, a little, I, I get a little, sometimes I get a little shy. I'm in a restaurant. I'm here. I'm married 14 years. And like, she looks at me with those eyes. I'm like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, what do you want to eat? I don't know. <laughs> Let's get out of here. You know. It's cool, you know, it, it, it gets the romance thing going. You need to work on the romance. It's wonderful. Why not work on it, you know? And then you do things right during the day. I'm going to be careful. My wife's right here. My mother's probably watching. Hi, Mom. Um, so on, on live stream, that is. And so when you spend time cultivating the relationship, and if I say, I want to I make Sandra happy, not just with that, but doing other things, guess what happens? If I, I, I'm out to help her and to bless her, guess what happens to me? I get blessed back. The Bible says, give and it will be given to you. Take, and you're going to be more hungry. Give, and it will you. So what we have to learn how to be is good receivers. And the only way you can become a good receiver is become a good giver. This is how it is in finances, folks. Why do we badger you with tithing and offering? Is because we're trying to build a church? Absolutely, that's not the reason why. Reason why, you try to hold on to your money, you're going to always want money. When you give your money away and trust God, he blesses you. It's just it's, it's a concept. You want respect? You give respect, you'll receive respect. If you try to take it, respect, and make it happen, you won't be respected. In marriage, it's the same thing. Well, how do you, why same thing? Men and women are different. You've probably heard this before. Men are microwaves, women are crockpots. You got to put the things in the morning and turn it on slow cook, and by the time you get home at 6 o'clock at night, it's a nice, scrumptious, delicious meal. You put meat in the microwave, it tastes rubbery. So, you know, there's something about a crock pot, my friends. So why not invest in your wife? You know, call her in the day, honey, you look beautiful. You just threw a carrot in the crock pot. You know, why not work? Is that the whole reason you're married? No, it's just one of the expressions. Of it. And by the way, when sex is probably, they say about 5% of your marriage, 2 to 5% of your marriage. And when it's going well, it's fine. When it's not going well, it affects the rest of your marriage. It's important that you not deprive each other except for a time of fasting and prayer. You are sinning against God if you're not together with your spouse. I'm sorry to tell you that. That's the truth. Why not honor God with our bodies? Why not honor God in our relationships? I want to say, the second thing I want to say as we conclude this morning, preparing for great sex while you're single. A person can begin to prepare for great sex even as being a single person. Well, how do you do that? Well, isn't it a lot better to go into a relationship like this than like this? You want to prepare for a great sex life? How about keeping yourself pure now? How about not looking at pornography, which is a farce? It feeds all the wrong things. If you want to destroy your sexual intimacy, pornography will ruin it. It will absolutely destroy. No, it spices. Now, it does not spice things up. It might spice things up for a short period of time, but eventually will give you unnatural attractions that can never be satisfied. You have to go to the bigger and bigger and bigger. That's why there's all this crazy nonsense that's going on. The Bible talks about these things, which I don't even want to bring up. The Bible is explicit about the things people used to do to satisfy their sexual longings. It's disgusting. I mean, horrific stuff. But give, and it shall be given to you Press down, shaking together. The pressing down and shaking together works pretty good, by the way. When you have it in the right context, you are giving. You are giving. You will receive if you give. And, you know, there's, there's a farce out there. It's called, how many heard about shacking up or living together? Let's just try. I mean, I, I, just, I just bought a new pair of shoes, which I'm not wearing this morning because I'm not quite sure they're going to work. So once I wear them outside, I can't bring them back because they'll be scarred up. And that's a pair of shoes. How about this? Try before you buy, right? You know, listen, you wouldn't buy a car without trying it out first, would you? So why would you marry somebody without first seeing if she can do the test drive? He can do the test drive. Well, this is from a secular psychologist. A census reported that 72% is an increase in the number of cohabitating couples since 1990. For many people in our culture, living together before marriage has been normal. I remember when my wife and I were ready to get married. Why aren't you guys living together? It's like, what's wrong with you? Now people buy, I mean, listen, if you've made this mistake, please understand there's no condemnation for those in Christ. But now it's like you buy a house first, you live together, and then you get married later on. It's backward. Unfortunately, research shows that this test drive approach doesn't work. It just is not an equal alternative. Cohabitating couples report 
lower levels of satisfaction in a relationship than married couples. Do you realize that? Studies have also shown that cohabitation is correlated with unhappiness and domestic violence. There's more domestic violence in cohabitation than marriage, hands down. And if a whole, a cohabitating couple ultimately marries, they have a higher percentage of propensity for divorce than those that white. Why? Because they don't understand commitment. They don't understand God's ways. God's ways work. Man's ways fail in comparison. You know, when you test drive a car and you take it around the block, you're checking it out, you hand it back to the, to the person that owns the car, the car's fingers are not hurt. You test drive an individual, someone gets hurt. You know, even, I, I'm going to step on some toes here, even, even if you're not having sex and all that kind of stuff, why do you want to... Why do you want to get involved with all these relationships and have a broken heart? The Bible says in, in Song of Solomon, do not awaken love for the right time. Why not wait till you find God's plan for you and then invest your heart in somebody? Why do you want to go back and try all these people on? Even having sex, and, and, and by the time you meet your spouse, you get all this baggage. Why would you want that, folks? So for those who are single, you want to have a great sex life? You can do it right now by keeping yourself pure. Be the one to find the right one. The more you prepare yourself, the more right you will be. I thank God that I took a five-year hiatus from dating and getting serious with any kind of woman. And I met my wife, and I could tell you, and I'll say this, our behavior was always appropriate. And that's Ricardo. Our behavior is always appropriate. We didn't do anything in front of you that we'd be ashamed of. Of course, a lot of you don't care if we kiss. But anyhow, that's beside the point. But we, we acted in a way that was honorable. And I want to encourage you that way. And I also want to say this as well. In verse Corinthians 10 12 says this, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. If you don't think you can fall in sexual sin, you're deceiving yourself. No temptation is overtaking you except for what is common to man. God is faithful. We're not allowed to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, will also provide a way to escape for you. I want to conclude where we began. There is no condemnation for those in Christ if you've made mistakes if you had an abortion if you had multiple marriages multiple sex partners if you were involved with all kinds of deviant sex practice if you're involved right now with pornography or you're flirting with the girl or guy at work or at the gas station or wherever the person's found you're flirting online with a Facebook friend that you used to know in high school that you got reacquainted with on Facebook and you really enjoy getting that Facebook and your heart kind of pumps it's time to select scroll and delete that person from your contact list please block the person out your spouse should have e equal opportunity to check out your Facebook account and you should have no secrets in that regard don't go there folks don't go there understand this is very serious and God wants to bless your marriage Bible says there's no condemnation for those in Christ my friends maybe some of you are not in Christ this morning today could be your day for that let's just pray right now I want to pray for some broken hearts and things of that today. Father, we thank you, God, that your word is here as a light into our path. Father, that you have plans to prosper us, to give us a hope in the future. And the reason why you tell us to abstain from sexual sin is not because you want to hamper our fun. It's because you want us to have the greatest amount of fun and the greatest amount of joy. And Father, we ask for you to forgive us for believing the lie that we can take and not give. Lord, I pray that you'd heal those right now. People that have been through a couple of marriages, people that just got divorced, people that are involved with, or have a promiscuous past. Father, we thank you. There's no condemnation for those in Christ. And so, Father, we give our lives afresh to you today. We refuse to believe condemnation, and we, we embrace your forgiveness. Lord, I pray you'd heal marriages in this place. Father, I pray that marriages would be healed sexually, spiritually, socially economically we ask for healing upon marriages today we also pray for healing for those that are single lord that you've made them in your image and you have a plan for them so before we conclude today the bible says there's no condemnation for those in christ if you're not in christ there is condemnation why because you're made in god's image and god cannot face you and handle you without the payment of sin that's only through Jesus Christ. You have to be in Christ. You can have a new beginning. You don't have to get your act together and then give your life to Christ. Christ accepts you as you are. He buys you as you are and helps restore you to what you've called to become. 
So if you want to do that today, the Bible, Bible says, the Bible talks about giving your life to Christ, not believing in Christ. It says those who are in Christ, not those who believe in Christ or think about Christ. So let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to wash me from all of my sins. I choose to walk away from what is wrong. I thank you that you have my best in mind, and I choose to follow you. I choose to trust you, Jesus, that you forgive my sins. Cleanse me right now. I receive your forgiveness. I thank you that my sins are washed away, that I am brand new. And Lord God, I choose this day to follow you. You are the captain of my life. I choose with your help to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to ask uh, Esteban if you can sing a closing song. As we do, I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. If you have any prayer concerns. Also, if you'd like to come to 201 today, before such paths to grow a spiritual life.